welcome. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Patricia Teppenhart. I'm the Senior Vice President for Strategic Initiatives in the New Jersey State Chamber of Commerce. And I wanna welcome all of you this morning and thank you for joining us. Um, I also want to recognize um, our CEO, Tom Bracken, who will be with us in the audience this morning, but has given me the privilege of fully facilitating this discussion. So I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to be in this position to be um, in community with all of you as we strive towards a more equitable business climate here in the state of New Jersey. To kind of give a little bit of perspective on how we came to be um, engaged on these issues, our CEO, Tom Bracken, has had a long-standing friendship and personal relationship with John Harmon, who is the CEO and founder of the African American Chamber of Commerce. And we at the State Chamber, similarly to so many other business colleagues across the country, recognized in the aftermath of George Floyd's murder that we had a responsibility um, to uplift the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, both within our own chamber and within our member organizations. And so out of that came a commitment to five particular strategic priorities as they relate to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Workforce diversity, board diversity, access to capital, capital corporate citizenship, and the topic we'll be discussing today, supplier diversity. Um, for many employers, the, the concepts of supplier diversity sort of feel familiar, but as we've been engaging in conversations with our colleagues across the state on this topic over the last couple of months, what we've also come to realize is that it can feel overwhelming and complicated. And so today's conversation is designed to be sort of a 101. Like, what do I need to think about if I wanna get started? If I've already started, what are some tweaks or adaptations I could put in place to have a more impactful and effective supplier diversity initiative? And I want to recognize the fact that with us this morning are a number of colleagues that I've had the privilege of working with over the last couple of months through our supplier diversity collaborative. We launched the collaborative back in February, actually when we had our last webinar on the topic of supplier diversity. And we asked our colleagues who were in attendance to sign on, like join us in a community of people who are interested in tackling this issue and identifying ways to sort of create a better wheel, not reinvent the wheel as it currently exists, but to actually be in conversation with colleagues who can share some of the challenges and obstacles that currently exist for women and minority owned businesses that are looking to compete, and then to recreate something that is more impactful and innovative in order to create equality of opportunity. And I see in the audience, so many of the colleagues of our 30 member collaborative today. And I have to tell you, like, this has been no joke. We meet monthly, we meet sometimes multiple times a month. We have hard and candid conversations around what some of the current challenges and obstacles are, both on the creating a supplier diversity initiative end and on the diverse supplier end. And today we have the privilege of being with one of our colleagues, Stephanie Locker, who's gonna share with us some of her expertise and, and content around how to get started in a supplier diversity initiative. Before we dig into the content of today's conversation, I wanna thank Bank of America for being the sponsor for this DEI virtual series. Um, we have a number of conversations on the horizon. The next one in August will be about DEI professionals. So sort of how supplier diversity initiatives can look different within a workplace, so can the structure of a DEI position. For some businesses, it's actually an entire team of folks who are committed to ensuring that DEI is woven into the very fabric of your business. For some organizations, it's volunteers who are, are raising their hand and saying, I'm willing to lead these initiatives with my colleagues and maybe they run employee resource groups. And so in August, we'll have a conversation with a couple of our colleagues who have the privilege of leading these roles in their workplaces and kind of giving us all some tips for how we could do something similar based off of the infrastructure that we have in place. So stay tuned for more information about that. And thank you again to Bank of America for your steadfast commitment to all of the work that we're doing around diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're happy to be able to have these conversations with our colleagues and we wouldn't be able to do it without your support. So with that, before uh, I waste anyone's time, I wanna move right into the content of our conversation and introduce to us today, Stephanie Locker, who is the CEO and managing partner of Locker & Company a management consulting firm that specializes in providing solutions for strategy throughout through execution headquartered in Passaic, New Jersey. 
She brings more than 15 years of experience in supplier diversity and is a former big three and big four consultant. She opened her own firm, Lockerbie, in 2019, where she manages a team of consultants who solve complex business problems for their Fortune 500 and private equity clients. Her business currently holds nine diverse supplier certifications on both the state and federal level. She earned her Master's of Science in Supply Chain Management from Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey, and a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Montclair State. In December 2021, Stephanie was appointed to the New Jersey Pride Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors to oversee supplier diversity and certification. She's currently overseeing the executive order that focuses on a statewide initiative that is reorganizing how the state works with diverse suppliers. So I'd like to welcome Stephanie into the room. And um, Stephanie, if there's anything that I missed in your really impressive bio, feel free uh, to chime in and let us know if there's anything else that we should know to sort of put some framing and context around um, your expertise in this issue. Thanks, Patricia. I really appreciate the background, the intro. So just to kind of um, add some more detail and color around it. Um, so what I essentially do with my company is I often go in and set up procurement departments from end to end. So that includes supplier diversity programs. I call it procurement with purpose. So I started in the procurement field uh, over 15 years ago and I saw how much value there was with diversifying the supplier base. So I also saw how low the numbers were. So I thought that my next move would be to create a company that's led by diverse individuals to help companies with that purpose. So um, with my role at the New Jersey Pride Chamber, I help LGBTQ businesses by creating resources and training around increasing their maturity level in order to get into that procurement pipeline. And then on the flip side, I help our corporate partners with getting these great companies into their procurement streams. So excited to kind of bring everything full circle. Thank you so much. And I want to share that, you know, as I mentioned, part of our supplier diversity collaborative has really, I think one of the most beneficial parts of our work together has just been the casual and candid conversations we've been able to have. That we have a group of individuals who are both leading diverse companies and also people who are looking to figure out how can they make their companies walk the walk in better alignment with the talk that they've talked over the last couple of years. And so one of the most important conversations I think we can have to start today's talk is why should companies care about supplier diversity? I know this is something that you're really passionate about, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think that they should care because it works. So, I mean, that's the, that's the simple answer, but the reason that it works is because some of the benefits that we're seeing is that they're increasing their competition, they're becoming more innovative, they're driving their costs down, especially with the supply chain issues, we're noticing that it optimizes the way that their supply chain works. And then the outcome is that their final product or service better relates to not only their employees, but their consumers and the companies that they're surrounding. I love that. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we've started doing this work over the last about 18 months to two years, and we're not alone. There are a lot of companies or organizations who have articulated a commitment to DEI. And what I think we're finding is a couple of things. One, um, COVID has really taken a front and center space in a lot of the strategic thought leadership that's occurring in businesses and perhaps has put some of the DEI commitments on the back burner. And we know that these are long systemic historical issues that can't afford to be on the back burner. And so we want to identify ways to sort of keep people's feet to the fire and move this dialogue and these action plans forward. But we also, in our conversations with colleagues, have realized that for many folks, as I said at the beginning, it feels sort of overwhelming. Like, I understand that I should be committed to supplier diversity. I understand what you're saying, that at the end of the day, it makes me more competitive and can also help my bottom line. In addition to being the right thing to do, I just don't know where to get started. So if you're in a conversation with someone who says, I hear you, I want to do this. I'm just so overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. What are the first like one, two to three things you would advise someone to do in order to take those first steps into this commitment? So in my opinion, leadership buy-in is absolutely number one. But once they have that, then they can create objectives for the initiative that align with the overall business objectives, which will also help with that leadership buy-in. And then the team that is built around that should also be diverse so that you have inclusion right from the start. 
And then they can leverage kind of what we were speaking to earlier about leveraging those internal resource groups to help drive that cultural shift because it will be a, you know, an end-to-end -end shift both from the organizational level and then the employees within that organization. And then create a rewards program so that you're really getting people excited and engaged. Because what I often see is that there's a gap between like the supplier diversity team and then actually getting into the procurement work stream and the procurement team gets pushed back from their stakeholders, you know, because they've used the same companies forever and you know why would I change so being able to change it at every level and then showing the value at every level and making sure that they're rewarded for doing that as you've provided consulting support to companies who are taking these steps what are some of the examples you've seen for rewards programs that have been impactful or effective so I think the most fun reward that I've seen or incentive is the uh, like social impact excursions where they're able to choose something where they can either go there and actually do the act and make sure that they're um, driving positivity in, in several different ways throughout their own community or being able to do some like type of charitable, charitable contribution, especially, you know, in light of COVID, people weren't able to go as many places. So I found people get really excited about that. And then also it it takes the idea of supplier diversity and it just takes it one step further. I love that so much because as I mentioned at the beginning, one of our other DEI strategic priorities is around corporate citizenship. And one of the things we've talked about in our collaborative is the opportunity to bring folks into these conversations based off of where they are ready. So for some companies, maybe their readiness exists around board diversity. For others, maybe it exists around workforce diversity. And for others, maybe it exists around supplier. And so what we know is that if you start focusing on one, it becomes easier to sort of thread that needle between all of these different priorities. And what you've just identified is a really organic way to have a supplier diversity initiative also be a complement to your company's corporate citizenship responsibilities. I love that. I'm gonna ask you another question in relation to the top three or first three things you mentioned. What if, and, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, but I suspect you do, because you usually have an answer for every question that I ask you, and I'm so appreciative. I, I think we've all agreed that leadership starts at the top and that we need leadership buy-in. And have you seen successful models where leadership hasn't quite yet been on board, but other employees in a company have been able to bring leadership along and get their buy-in? Do you have any suggestions for anyone who's on the call who is primed and ready to have their company take on this responsibility, but isn't quite yet there with their leadership team? So they can still make an impact um, in, in some a few different ways. So if they don't have a budget, they can make an impact by at least trying to bring diverse suppliers into the conversation. If they do have a budget, even if they're not that senior leadership, they can move the needle at least in small ways by utilizing some of that budget to diverse suppliers. And when I say use diverse suppliers, they still have to like win the bid. You know, you can't just give the money because they're a diverse supplier, but just including them in the conversation, uh, even if it's just with um, helping them increase their maturity level to get them at the table, because sometimes that's an issue. So creating like some type of mentorship or capacity building program, if they can do that, they can do that without a budget. They can just do that with their time. Uh, and then when they do have diverse suppliers come to the table, it's a diverse supplier that's going to come to bat in a meaningful way that will start getting the attention of the senior leadership. I love that. That's so helpful because I think that is one of the things that can be scary if your leadership hasn't yet identified this as a strategic priority or if they haven't allocated resources specifically for that, it can feel really overwhelming. But there are all things that we can do in our sphere of influence that can create opportunities to change leadership's perspective. So. Let's shift gears a little bit because I think one of the things we try to do in this DEI conversation series is bring the real challenges and obstacles to light. Not to just skim the surface and be like, oh my gosh, it's so great. We should start a supplier diversity initiative and it'll be awesome. Because I think the real value in the conversations that we're having is really addressing the existing challenges and obstacles that diverse suppliers are meeting when they try to enter into opportunities for bids and contracts. And we've talked about this a lot in the collaborative, but for folks who haven't been a part of our intimate conversations, what are some of the challenges, challenges that exist for diverse suppliers seeking opportunity to compete? 
I think the largest challenge is the accountability on the stakeholders. So typically, you know, they have this policy and this commitment, or, or maybe they don't even have a commitment and they just have a desire to use more diverse suppliers, but there's nothing that's incentivizing the stakeholders. So even if you have procurement add one diverse supplier to every RFP, it's, it's still gonna take a while to really move the needle for the stakeholders because they've been using the same supplier for 20 years, or they're just really comfortable with using a name that they recognize or a larger company. So I think that there needs to be stronger war rewards for the employees uh, to get them excited about adopting that idea. It's also important for companies to get creative with using diverse suppliers with mentoring and capacity building programs. And then they can also even use them as subcontractors. I just talked to a client recently where they're like, our stakeholders are not comfortable with moving with a supplier that they don't know. Are you okay with you know, being a subcontractor for a prime that we've used for 20 years? I mean. I'm, I'm all for that because it not only gets me in the door, but then it, it also shows what I'm capable of doing, not only to the prime, but to the company. So for me, it opens more doors. And I'm just really thankful that the company thought about doing it in that way, because it does give me the opportunity to you know, show them what we can do. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that what you just articulated is what kind of resonates over and over again, whether it's in the collaborative or in other conversations that getting um, companies to sort of shift out of their comfort zone with their usual pool of contractors is the challenge. And so one of the things we've talked about, about a lot in our DEI work is that we just need to get folks in the room together, that once people can start to build relationships, then things happen more organically, but we've been so siloed and COVID hasn't helped. COVID has created additional challenges for people to sort of get out and expand their networks. And so being able to work as a subprime on a major contract is a great way to find a, a way in, improve yourself, and then ultimately, hopefully become the prime yourself. Some of the other things that we've talked about in the collaborative relate to um, cash flow issues and access to capital and the way, you know, there are sometimes a, a disconnect between the procurement department and the finance department. And can you talk a little bit about, you know, if someone is thinking about embarking upon this journey, what kind of finance policies or payment policies they could put in place that would ease a burden on a diverse vendor? Yeah, so definitely negotiate for yourself. Uh, a lot of companies will push back on, you know, net 60, net 90 sometimes uh, payment terms. That's just not going to fly with a small business. So push back on them, let them know that uh, there is negotiating power there, and it's probably their most important piece of negotiating power. They can also work with their banks as far as getting some type of credit card uh, or some type of um, some type of avenue where they can extend their cash flow. Uh, you know, we've done that even in smaller amounts where you know we'll be able to put some expenses every month where instead of it being net 30, now it becomes net 60. Doing things creatively like that, applying for grants, uh, doing pitch competitions. A lot of pitch competitions or competitions in general have cash prizes. We've been you know the recipient of some of those. So getting really creative. Um, there are so many grants out there or even like the PPP loan. Um, I was a recipient of that as well. And that, that helped a lot of companies. And most of it was, you know, if it was under $150,000, a lot of them were forgiven. So leveraging avenues like that, I'm really thankful for having a bank that has been uh, very engaged with me and I'm able to always call them and ask for different types of options. There's also a Women's Center of Entrepreneurship in New Jersey where they're constantly talking about different types of grants and doing webinars around grants. So I actually was part of their webinar uh, like a week or two ago, and they wound up talking about a grant that I had no idea about. So I was able to apply for it uh, from being on the webinar. Uh, and then also the uh, NG, NJEDA is also really great about getting the word out about diff different types of grants. And I mean, there are so many, so just absolutely leverage all of your resources that are available and continuously reach out to them because there's grants that come out you know, constantly. And if you don't constantly keep reaching out, you might miss the opportunity because the window seems to also close pretty quickly. Oh, and then through your certifications, there's a lot of grants as well. So uh, the NGLCC is the National Chamber, the New Jersey Pride Chamber of Commerce. And they have a lot of different programs where you're able to gain access to capital. I just did one with Wells, Far Wells Fargo uh, in the spring that gave me access to about $400 million in capital. Not me personally, but you know, it was to the larger collaborative, but it, without that program, I wouldn't have had any access. 
Yeah, I think that one of the things that we've talked about in the collaborative is that there are a lot of resources, but sometimes you just don't know where to go, right? That it that, that some, you have to just sort of happen upon, to your point, like you were part of a webinar the other day and you just happened to hear about an opportunity that hadn't really crossed your desk yet. And I think the lesson learned for our colleagues on our call today who were looking to create supplier diversity initiatives, I think what you just outlined hopefully highlights just how hard you have to work in order to stay financially in the game. And so as someone who is thinking about building relationships with diverse suppliers, I think the request would be, think about what role you can play in easing that burden. So are there mechanisms that you can put in place within your financial management system that will make sure you're expediting payments out to diverse vendors, right? So don't, so anything that we can do as we're driving the bus as someone who's looking to create a supplier diversity initiative, I think we need to acknowledge that there's a shared responsibility both on the end of the diverse supplier to manage all of the complicated contracts and, and grant applications you just mentioned, but also to be a good partner is to evaluate how our own internal policies or procedures could be increasing or decreasing burdens on the people that we're working with, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And then there are also some platforms like uh, Meta has a platform that they just put out, I believe, a year or two ago, where it's specifically designed to help diverse suppliers uh, get cash flow quicker. So I believe it's like, you know, net net five or net zero or something where they leverage that platform and they get paid that much faster. Getting paid faster sounds like a really good idea. <laughs> Yeah, especially when your costs are high and you know inflation goes up or your supply chain has issues, it's, it could be do or die for a lot of companies. And, and we're confronting all of these things now at the same time, right? So these conversations I think also are happening with a different level of earnestness than maybe they would have happened three or four years ago, you know, and, and even different than they were a year ago. A year ago, we were really focusing on, you know, how to come out of a pandemic um, in a way that makes you financially stable. But now we're dealing with increased supply chain issues and inflation and gas prices. And all of this is compounding to create everything that's just a little bit more challenging than it was even a couple of months ago. Um, one of the questions that we have talked about in our collaborative calls are, okay, great, I'm, I'm ready. We have leadership commitment. We have taken a look at our policies and procedures. We know we want to work with diverse suppliers. I don't know where to start in looking for them. So for someone who's sort of at that phase in their initiative building, where would you tell them to start? I would leverage their local affiliates. They have databases of certified suppliers. And the reason that certification can be important is because the companies that are certified have been vetted and already have at least a specific level of maturity to do business. Um, so especially as they're trying to kind of get their program up and started, they want to have, they want to make sure that they do it really well by using suppliers that have that level of maturity that they're going to be able to perform. So that's like the number one thing that I would recommend. And then in addition to that, there are tons of conferences. So um, I'm going to a conference uh, in Vegas next week for the NGLCC, where there's gonna be hundreds of diverse suppliers. And what's gonna happen there is they're not just gonna be LGBT companies, there's a lot of intersectionality with diverse companies. So you'll also be able to meet other women-owned companies, minority-owned companies, disability-owned companies. So I've noticed that going to those conferences, you get diverse, company, diverse companies from every angle. And um, I found a lot of value in that. I actually also went to WeBank a few weeks ago where it's women-owned companies. There were like three football fields full of uh, you know, com companies and corporations, both companies that are excited about getting women-owned companies into their procurement pipeline, and then uh, women-owned companies that were there to pitch their businesses. And if and if I run a really small shop and I you know, don't necessarily have both the time or financial resources to go out and about and go to these conferences, maybe I'm a one person shop, maybe I'm a sole proprietor and I haven't yet built out a, an, an internal infrastructure to have other people focusing on these things. Are there places you would recommend our colleagues go online to look for lists that might be helpful? Yeah, as an example, the New Jersey Pride Chamber, if you go to newjerseypridechamber.org, we have a list right on our website. 
and a lot of the other affiliates do the same thing. So if you just go into the website, you can search by service, by goods, uh, and it'll tell you who's certified, who's not, who's just a member. So you even have access to other companies that are members and aren't certified. Um, so that it, even if you don't care about certification, that's, that's an option as well. Thank you. I just, I wanted to ask you that because I wanted to give an opportunity to give a plug to my colleague, Patrick Daly, who mentioned in the chat box exactly what you said. Patrick is such a good ambassador for all of the chambers. And he mentioned in the chat box, basically exactly what you said that, you know, our colleagues at the Pride Chamber and the African American Chamber and the Hispanic Chamber, the Asian Indian Chamber, the Chinese American Chamber, everyone has lists and resources of their membership organizations and their membership companies. And, you know, building a relationship with those chambers can be incredibly influential and helpful in helping you figure out where to get started. Because sometimes, and you, you, Stephanie, you've seen me give this example before, right? Sometimes I know I need someone who can make a black insulated mug. I just know that that's the one thing that I need. And I can go through the lists on these different chamber membership websites and find someone who might be able to meet that very specific need. So there are ways I think to sort of ease ourselves in to the process of identifying diverse suppliers that doesn't, to the point you raised before, doesn't require an overarching commitment to do the whole thing at once. We can start really small by, by identifying like, oh, we have a contract that's about to lapse with a certain vendor before we automatically renew it. Let's take a look around and see who might be able to meet those needs and expand our relationships with diverse suppliers. And going to our colleagues at our multicultural chambers throughout the state is a great way to identify some of those folks in New Jersey who can meet those needs. Um, the other part of what we've talked about, and this is an overarching thread as it relates to DEI, but in particular, as we're talking about supplier diversity, there are metrics that we can and should be tracking. And some, and, and I will share in full disclosure, we at the state chamber, we are a part of the Supplier Diversity Collaborative. Um, my colleague, Neil Wildonger is our Senior Vice President of Operations, and he is the staff representative from our state chamber on our collaborative because we are doing our internal work to identify opportunities to expand our relationships with diverse suppliers. And we're at that phase right now where we, we're going back and looking, we haven't done this before. We haven't identified affirmatively who, that, who we work with identifies as a diverse supplier. So we're now going back through our financial records, trying to pull that data to come up with some baseline data to then inform goals and objectives moving forward. So as we're talking about numbers and things, Stephanie, you brought up some really great points about how companies can track their commitment to supplier diversity and where they've made good and made some progress. Can you share a little bit of your perspectives on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that they can, at a minimum, just kind of highlight the diverse spend. They can do it by the dollar amount. They can do it by percentage. They can do it by even just a count of how many diverse suppliers that they have. And then if they want to get really fancy, they can start uh, calculating their economic impact, the total cost savings that come with that, because there will absolutely be cost savings, the impact on their revenue, their increased market share, uh, any type of like diverse deals that have been won, uh, maybe some that have been lost as well, so that they're at least showing that they're putting them to the bring them to the table. And then they can even track their tier two diverse suppliers. So what that would be is that would capture all of those subcontractor uh, diverse suppliers that that matter as well that will possibly impact their supply chain and as they're coming up with those metrics part of what we've been talking about also is it, it's one thing to sort of have the commitment and there's another thing about public accountability and i love what you just said also about like being transparent that sometimes we've engaged with diverse vendors and we haven't sealed the deal with them and that's an important metric to also track two-part question one, and I wanted to ask this earlier and then I got sidetracked because you said something brilliant and then I moved on to where, wherever you were going in that conversation. But one, as um, one of the things that's been discussed is, okay, so I am ABC minority owned company and I am reaching out to XYZ big dog because I want to you know, get into their procurement you know, process. And as soon as they hear that I am a minority owned firm, they're like, 
oh, we should have you talk to our DEI folks, but the DEI folks don't often talk to the procurement folks. And it's sort of a way to satisfy a checkbox to say, we met with all of these diverse companies and then yet still at the end of the day, their bottom line doesn't change. So, so if you can weave some thoughts about that process and ways to avoid sort of perpetuating those barriers and missteps, I would appreciate it, especially as it relates to um, ways to publicly make your data transparent and um, to hold companies accountable to the goals and objectives that they've articulated. Yeah, so I'll answer that question first. So as far as their commitment and being transparent, uh, make it publicly available and provide updates on the progress. So I just saw a report come out, I believe it was yesterday for Meta, where they're publicly releasing the diversity reports and it shows exactly how they're tracking against their goals. And I mean, that's awesome. You know, you can't get any better than that because they're not only making this large commitment, but they're like, not only have we hit it, but we've exceeded it. Here's our report, here's the summary, you know, like here are all of our numbers. So that transparency is awesome. It makes me want to use all of their products, you know, from a consumer standpoint. And it makes me want to do business with them from, as, a, as a business owner. So that level of transparency just needs to be there. And I think without it, you're not, you're not going to have the same impact. And with it, the in their increase in profitability is going to go through the roof. Um, you know, that's what studies have shown over and over again. So there's only benefits to being really transparent, even as the, there's this great resignation where people are going to retain employees, they're going to attract employees. So there's this like plethora of benefits that people just can't deny. So there is no downside in my opinion, unless you just aren't really committed. So if they're not really committed, they're not going to make that public statement. And if they are, they should. And that commitment alone will have, um, you know, benefits both on the workforce side and then also the consumer side where it will increase their profitability. And then uh, to your first question, as a company, um, I see it all the time where there's a significant gap between supplier diversity company or supplier diversity departments and procurement. It's typically not a way that I go for the short term. That's more of the long game for me because the average acquisition time frame is 18 months. So that is absolutely not sustainable for diverse suppliers, in my opinion. Um, I do try to work with companies on coming up with an onboarding process that makes more sense because it, it's just not working in that way. And most of my quicker successes when it comes to getting contracts is actually not using my diversity status and either going right through the procurement pipe stream uh, or also going to the middle market where they don't have supplier diversity and that seems to be a faster acquisition time frame, which you know is really disappointing on, on my end because I am a diverse supplier and I'm trying to use it in that way to make sure that there can be more diversity within their supply chain, but it does seem to often be a barrier. So Todd, and we and I didn't prep us to have this conversation, but we have had this conversation and I feel very comfortable asking you because I know you have really insightful thoughts and we've talked about this a lot also as part of the collaborative is around the certification process, right? So we have a, a wide range of perspectives and opinions in our 30 person collaborative around the benefits, challenges and opportunities that exist with being certified as women owned, LGBTQ owned, disability owned, minority owned, uh, disability owned, there's a lot of steps that companies have to go through to get certification and different certifications require different processes and timelines and financial and time investments in recertifications. And members of the collaborative have articulated various feelings about whether or not those certifications have yielded results or return on their investment of time and resources in getting those certifications. So I was hoping we could just have a little bit of a chat so we can plant the seeds for some of our colleagues who are on the call as they're thinking about working with diverse suppliers and certifications and what it means and how we can make them meaningful and also whether or not they're necessary for you know, each company's individual goals. If we can kind of take some of those intimate conversations we had in the collaborative and shine a little bit of a spotlight on them here, I think that could be helpful. Definitely, so it depends on their target. So if their target is federal, state, or local government, it is absolutely necessary. You will not, I mean, you could still win the bid 
but you will absolutely have an incentive because typically there, depending on the state agency, of course, there are incentives where, you know, say you bid $100,000, there's a 10% incentive for a diversifier where it looks like they're bidding $90,000. So if you're bidding uh, comparably to a non-diversifier, you will win. The private corporations doesn't always necessarily work like that. Some of them do, uh, but a lot of them don't. They're just, they don't have the maturity level yet or they're not governed by entities that care or that require that. So in those circumstances, it's a lot tougher to pitch the need for it because I don't always see it. Um, but in some I do, and the really advanced ones I do, and they have incentives in other ways even by offering mentorship programs and capacity programs and those grants that we talked about earlier. I've exploited every opportunity possible with my certifications. Um, I have a, had an amazing, I'm still in an amazing mentorship with Ernst & Young. I would have never gotten that, that mentorship opportunity without that certification. So for me, it really mattered and it made it really important. Um, I also had a couple of programs through the NGLCC with uh, Wells Fargo because they they do amazing capacity programs and it gave me levels to access or access to levels of CEOs that I would have never had access to where I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations with, you know, literally the highest level CEOs in the world through these organizations and these certifications. So I see a lot of value in that way. I don't see as much value when it comes to the private sector as of right now. There's some and there's definitely like a, a handful, I would say, and maybe a couple of handfuls of companies that really uh, provide a good incentive there. There just aren't that many. So if your target is the private sector, leverage it for the capacity building programs and the mentorships and the network that you get from it because there's significant value there. Um, try not to get frustrated on the, on the public procurement, I mean, the uh, private procurement side, but there is opportunity, it just takes a while. And if they can go a different route and just try to go right through through a stakeholder or the procurement department, that's probably a faster route. We have a great question from one of our collaborative partners actually in the chat box. And she says, it sounds like you're saying pursuing business as a minority diverse supplier is prohibitive and in itself keeps the company from getting in the door. How do you change that attitude? Great question. Yeah, so it depends on the company. So a lot of times what happens is they will have a supplier diversity person that is just there to check a box and you can tell pretty quickly. So if that is the case, then if you have relationships or if you don't have relationships, build them with the stakeholders and try to get in that way so that you can at least start getting into the company and then tell the supplier diversity person about it later to help their diversity metrics. But um, changing the attitude just really depends on you know, how they're empowered. Are their stakeholders accountable? Because can you imagine being a supplier diversity manager and not having any empowerment or um, not having stakeholders that actually need to care or incentivize to care? It probably gets really frustrating on there too. It probably makes them give up. You can actually see it at certain companies where they have very short stints of supplier diversity managers because it just seems like they get really frustrated. I love that. I love the question and I love your answer. And I, and I think we, we see that kind of across the board as companies have espoused commitments to DEI in different ways. We see that staff attrition rates are actually pretty high. Um, and that is a very telling metric in and of itself, right? That if, if you are having, you know, if you're espousing a commitment to DEI and you're creating positions for people to lead these initiatives and then they're leaving rather quickly, there's a good chance it's because there's not an alignment between someone coming into the job with a true vision and passion for the work and a company that's just sort of tokenized the position and said, we're going to have someone lead this work, but then not actually empower them to do it with integrity. And I think, you know, again, kind of the intersectionality between workforce diversity and supplier diversity and all of these things, they all come together and kind of paint a true picture of where a corporate partner stands on these issues. Um, we're coming up at 945. If there are any other questions or comments from our colleagues in the audience, I encourage you to enter them into the chat box. Um, Stephanie, while we're waiting to see if there are any other questions coming in, are there any other things that you'd like to share or um, provide sort of tidbits or, or, or advice to folks as they're considering how to move forward in creating their own supplier diversity initiatives? 
Yeah, and actually one more point to the last question where if they see that there's a supplier diversity advocate in the procurement space, their shots are definitely better. So try to target those because the procurement person understands the benefits and if they already care about it, then it alleviates a lot of those roadblocks that you'll see. So I've seen a lot of success in that, in that area. Um, and leverage your affiliates because a lot of times they'll have relationships with partner, corporate partners that are actively looking for diverse suppliers, even for very specific opportunities. So even if it's a small, um, you know, 15,000 or $5,000 engagement at first, it could really give you the foot in the door that you need to create larger opportunities for yourself. There's a couple questions coming in, but I also, I wanna add one, one other comment um, in relation to, to Sandra's question and comment in the chat box and sort of the follow-up to, to the points that you raised. I think we also just need to acknowledge that it's incredibly inequitable that we have to jump through so many hoops in order to have opportunity and that you have identified strategies that can help sort of navigate this bureaucratic and often um, complicated, I'm trying to find nice words to say, complicated pathways to, to get opportunity. But we also just need to acknowledge that it doesn't need to be this way. And that one of the things that we're hoping to identify through the Supplier Diversity Collaborative and through these conversations are ways that companies can make their processes work better so that diverse companies don't need to go to stakeholders and go to you know, backdoor ways to get in, that it should be transparent and it should be as equitable as possible. Um, and that the fact that you have to identify all of these ways really just identifies the challenges that exist and how unfair the process has been. And, and we are institutionalized to accept that we have to go through all of these hurdles. But what we're looking to identify here as partners in this work is ways to make sure those hurdles no longer exist so that we don't have to ask these questions and you don't have to identify these strategies that we can accept for face value that companies are interested in working with diverse vendors. And we can move on to increasing opportunity and getting you know, capital into the hands of, of diverse business owners. Um, uh, one of our colleagues also in the collaborative has asked, can you share once more what these certifications are that we should be looking into? And I know there are millions, so feel, have at it, Stephanie. Yeah, so a couple of them are the WBE. So that's Women Business Enterprise, Women Owned Business Enterprise. You can get that with just the state of New Jersey. It's free right now. Also SBE, which is Small Business Enterprise. You can also get that for free with the state of New Jersey. State of New Jersey just passed an executive order, which is going to include certification for LGBTQ businesses. That has not been implemented. Um, so right now you'd have to go through the NGLCC, which is the national private certification. We can also help you with that at the New Jersey Pride Chamber of Commerce because we're the local affiliate of that chamber uh, and I oversee certification for them. So if you have any questions about that one specifically, you can always reach out to me. So there's small business, women-owned business, there's minority-owned business as well. I believe that is also free with the state of New Jersey. You can also go to the private certifications for any of these. There's WeBank for women-owned. So it does have a cost to it, but you do get access to things like conferences, mentorships, capital, um, networking events. And then there's also a hub zone. So it's historically underutilized business zone. What that means is that you have to employ 35% of your employees have to live within a hub zone. So I'm hub zone certified. Uh, we're headquartered in Passaic, New Jersey. Passaic, New Jersey is a hub zone. And then I'm required to hire 35% of my employees that also live anywhere in the nation within a hub zone. I think that's a lot of them. There are also some other federal ones like the SBA 8A. Um, that's a small business program at the federal level. And I think, oh, DBE, Disadvantaged Business. You can also get that for free through the state, through the Port Authority for New York and New Jersey. And then there's also the veteran-owned ones. I'm not as familiar with those, um, but there are veteran organizations within New Jersey as well. I believe that certification might also be free. Excellent. Thank you so much. And then my colleague, Scott, at the Chamber asked a really good question. How can you immediately tell if a company is serious about diversity? So if I talk to anybody from their procurement or supplier diversity program and they, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, are you on my portal? 
I generally don't take them seriously anymore. The reason being is because they will not have a conversation with me unless I've already signed up for their supplier portal, which they never check or they check very rarely. So um, typically I move on to a different company after that, or you know, I'll, I'll be on their portal. There are thousands of portals though. So if a company doesn't understand that there are thousands of portals and they won't have a conversation with you until they're on theirs, you know, you can only you can only imagine how excited they are to use diverse suppliers, you know, and it is, it's pretty deflating. So I try to move on to somebody else. I, I appreciate that answer. And I think that that's kind of one of the things that we've talked about a lot within the supplier diversity collaborative is um, that there are companies for which their portal portals are ways for them to quantify how many diverse vendors they have relationships with. But to your point, the relationship doesn't often extend beyond what's written into this portal. There's no actual engagement beyond that, but somehow or another, they're able to take that data and report it back out to say that we have X number of diverse suppliers in our portal, but that doesn't necessarily translate back into spend or percentage or into actual engagement. Um, and so a way to sort of flip the script is for the relationship to come before people are required to spend the time to make the investment of things into the portal. Like it would be great to have that conversation exist on the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Whereas the person is saying like, I'd love to build a relationship with you and then feel free to enter your information into the portal. And then you know that the relationship is coming first, but rather you're just kind of a quantifiable metric that people can put into a database and, and somehow make themselves feel like they've done engagement. But we know that engagement is much more intense than that. Does that feel accurate? Oh yeah, that's a really great point. I've, actually, I've never thought about it in that way, that they're probably just taking that information and reporting it as if it's like some type of relation, relationship building exercise. And I mean, we've had to build resources for the chamber around just how to do that because it is very complex. And I've had to hire an employee just to do that. I think 60% of her time is just filling and updating portals because they also all need to be updated every time you get a new certification or you renew a certification. Because if you have an expired certification, that can flag you as not doing business with them as well. So it's just a really broken process. Yeah. I think that one of the other things that I've, I'm, and, I, and I've known this as we've been doing this work and having these conversations for the past year, but what I'm feeling in, in this conversation is just the weight of responsibility that's fallen on the shoulders of the diverse business company, the business owners to just do some of the most basic principles of business development, which then also then keeps you from actually doing the work or executing on the contract. And so that, that access to capital piece and that ability to sort of build out a staffing infrastructure is so incredibly important because to your point, the, the Pride Chamber hired someone just to do, is it the Pride Chamber or is it you at Lockerbie? I'm sorry if I misunderstood. Oh, it's me, it's me at Lockerbie, but what I do for them is I help them um, create resources for the LGBT companies. So that's a you know, huge part of my role. And we have an intern to help that we've hired as well, just to help. Right, so you have an intern at the chamber who's helping to identify these, these processes. You have a staff person within your own consulting firm who is just spending 60% of their time entering information into portals. And you have staff that is actually like doing the, the work of your consulting firm as well. And if yeah. you are an entrepreneur or you're a startup, there's so much that goes into building internal capacity um, that it can feel really overwhelming, which again, you know, please allow this to sort of be the point that resonates as a, as a result of this conversation. There are ways for us to do this as corporate leaders that are more efficient, more impactful and reduce the systemic barriers that we have created. And so as you listen to Stephanie and our colleagues, as we've had these conversations over the last year, share information about the challenges as they exist. I think it's incumbent upon us to identify ways that we can reduce those challenges and create opportunity that is meaningful and more efficient um, so that you can do the good work that you are an expert in doing as opposed to spending your time entering information to a portal that is like a black hole that goes nowhere. Um, I wanna add also in the chat box, um, another comment from Sandra, again, who is a member, she's, also, she's on our board and she's also a member of our collaborative. She reminds us all that training, education and awareness within the corporation top down where there's no training, there's no real commitment. 
Um, and then also Eileen Delavol, who's also a member of our collaborative, has mentioned that certifications also need to be updated as firms add services, also add new project history, not just when it expires. So again, kind of reinforcing the theme that like this data management or this profile management is in and of itself more than a full-time job. And so whatever we can do within the corporate world to reduce, um, you know, to increase efficiency, I think would be welcome to help you all contribute to the, the work that we need you to do. Um, are there any other questions or comments from the audience or Stephanie, is there anything else that you wanna add before we wrap up our time here? I think the only thing I would say is that if you're a diverse individual that's looking to start a company, uh, definitely leverage a, a mentor, reach out to your local affiliates. They have a lot of resources that can help you uh, to make sure that you're actually successful because a lot of a lot of businesses fail, especially as there are the barriers that you're talking about. So there, there are resources out there to help you. Just make sure that you leverage them. Thanks so much. I wanna thank all of you for being here today. I wanna to reiterate our appreciation to Bank of America for being our corporate sponsor for this conversation series. The series is designed to provide sort of 101 level content for folks who are really thinking about how to walk in alignment with their values and their commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I hope that today's conversation sort of planted some meaningful seeds for people who are interested in supplier diversity Stephanie, I'm so thankful for your contributions to the collaborative and I'm thankful for you um, donating your time to us and to our chamber colleagues today. I know that New Jersey is stronger and more equitable because of your leadership and I appreciate you. I have learned so much from you personally and based off of the comments that we're getting in the chat box, I think you were a big hit with, with our audience today too. I just wanna remind everyone um, again, that in August we'll be having a conversation, um, a round table conversation with some DEI professionals. I'll send information out about that. And also a huge nod to the State Chamber's communications team who has helped us launch our new monthly e-publication called Chamber Forward, which is the house for all of our things DEI related. Um, we'll be um, sharing a link to this webinar um, in that publication, but also as the registrant for today's webinar, you'll receive the link in advance. We have a lot of our Supplier Diversity Collaborative members with us today. Hi, Ebony, it's good to see you. Um, Catherine, I see you up there. Nick, I see you. Larry, I see you. I feel like I'm in that, remember that show where the woman used to have the mirror and say, I see you. I feel like that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm aging myself also, as I'm saying that. Um, Everyone, please take good care of yourselves. Nick mentioned in the chat box, Stephanie, good luck in Vegas. Um, we're all wishing you well out there. You're gonna kill it and you're gonna represent Jersey um, very well. I'm proud of you. And um, everyone take good care of yourselves and we'll be in touch soon. Thank you again. Thank you all. Thanks, Patricia, I appreciate it. Of course.